Today we're going to be talking about the subject of the justification of government, and this is a new subject for us, as we're now moving into the subject of political philosophy, which we're going to talk about from now for the next uh, few weeks. And we'll start, we're going to start off this week on a pretty abstract level. And what I mean by that is we're going to ask the most basic question we can ask about government, which is about its, its justification to exist at all. In other words, where does government derive its perceived rightness or legitimacy to be able to do the things that it does? Where does it derive that from? So we're going to look at, at this, the, the most abstract question about government, what makes it legitimate at all? Why do we have to obey government commands at all in the first place? We're going to be looking at this question, and then we're going to try and get onto more concrete issues um, to do with the relation between individual and the state <clears throat> next time, and subsequently we're going to get on to look at civil disobedience as well. So, starting off this week with the with the most abstract question, um, and we we know government primarily by its its institutions and the way that its institutions affect us and have a coercive force. And we furthermore have, have a relationship to those institutions. Um, the, the US system, as, as you know, is divided up into three different institutions or three different sort of parts, um, the executive, the legislative, and the, um, the courts, the Supreme Court as the as a sort of final, um, the final arbiter of the court system. So the, the US system has that set up, but that's not the same throughout the world. A lot of systems have what are called parliamentary democracies, which don't sort of distinguish between the executive and the legislative. And there are a lot of um, differences between um, among systems in terms of how the legislative branch works, and also the role of the courts within the system. Many of them, of course, have a monarchical system, which is a hangover from previous forms of, of government. So that there are a lot of differences, but all of them, all of these different systems have the major characteristic of any government, which is the the power to have its commands obeyed. And we'll we'll talk about we'll talk about the notion of power later on. But government has the ability to coerce, to exercise coercion against citizens across the whole expanse of its of its legitimate operation. In other words, within its borders. Government has the monopoly over coercive power within its borders, and that coercive power is is identified with two particular agents: the military, which is concerned with external threats, and the police, and its institutions, which are concerned with the internal um, challenges to order. So, government has a role of securing order, and that's exemplified by its two two major institutions. Um, the military and the police. So the, this idea of coercion is really what I'm getting at, and we, we're going to look a, a little bit more more closely at this relationship um, as as the first thing and try and figure out figure out what it is that makes government um, able legitimately to exercise its power of coercion. Now the the easiest approach and the most at first the most common sense approach it, it would seem to the issue of government and why do we need it and how is it justified is to ask a very simple question, namely, well, what would life be like if government didn't exist? In other words, if there were no such thing as government, let's imagine that we lived at a time prior to government existed, there was no such thing as a, as a common authority or a common power over individuals, what then would life be like? And depending on how we answer that question, Depending on how we respond to the question of what would life be like, that's going to determine what purpose we think government serves. If we think about Thomas Hobbes, and he, uh, we'll talk about his theories a little later, he had a very pessimistic idea of what life would be like without government. Hobbes thought that if government didn't exist or if government broke down, if the central coercive authority over individuals' lives broke down, then there, there would be what he called a war of all against all, a perpetual situation of war. 
So Hobbes took a very pessimistic view of human nature without this coercive force to keep it in check. And as a result, he argued that the primary purpose of government is to secure order. And he gave it very wide latitude and, and very wide scope of power and authority to, to do that, to secure order. So if you take a very pessimistic view, then you might end up with a theory like that. Another perspective is represented by John Locke, another English theorist. Um, in contrast to Hobbes, Hobbes was writing at the time of the English Civil War, and that obviously coloured his view of what government should be like and what government should do and why we need it, what we need it for. Locke had a somewhat more optimistic and sanguine view of life without government. He thought essentially that we would still have a sense of order, a sense of rule, but of course there would be disagreements. So we need government as a common power to simply resolve the disputes that would arise. But of course, Locke does not see the, the life without government as an orderless condition. Now another perspective, one that we're not going to pursue here, but it's, it's an interesting contrast, is represented by the French philosopher and political theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau argued that in contrast to both Locke and Hobbes, in fact, he, he argued that the, the state of nature, um, the, the, the sort of condition prior to government would in fact be not a, as Hobbes and Locke argued, one of dispute, but in fact would be one of perfect independence, perfect self-rule, and perfect autonomy. And that's only corrupted by developments towards society. So as Rousseau sees it, first we're as sort of individuals, primitive individuals in a state of nature, we're autonomous, we, we don't depend on anybody else. But it's only when society starts to develop that, that our dependence grows. And as Rousseau saw it, the only way of, of getting beyond that situation is to create a government which doesn't actually put us against one another, but, but in fact enfolds us all in this, in this whole that Rousseau called the general will. Now, we're, uh, we're not going to worry about that in this course, but it's an interesting contrast that Rousseau is probably the most optimistic perspective of, of the three, whereas Hobbes is obviously the most um, pessimistic. How you answer that question, you know, what would life be like without government, might very well colour your view of what purpose government serves. Now, let's take a look at the relation between authority and power. And this is brought out nicely by the set of thought experiments in the text on page 547 to 548. And I'm going to go over the, the first one here. You can take a look at the other two. They, they all pretty much have the same structure. There are three, three distinct um, thought experiments with, um, with an A, example and a B example. I think we can pretty much get what we need from the from the first one, so let's see if we can run through it. And what, what we're trying to do here is to figure out the relation between authority and power. Okay? Now we said I said at the beginning that government has this coercive um, this coercive rule. Government is, is a sort of instrument of coercion over our lives. Obviously there's a relation between government and power. It's the relation to authority that, that really should make us think and we really need to get a handle on here. Okay, so let's just run through it. Um, example A says, you fill out your federal income tax form and find that you owe the government $1,000. You write out a check for this amount knowing that if you do not pay the government what it demands of you, the penalties will be severe. B says, while you are walking home at night, a robber with a gun steps out of the shadows and demands all the money in your wallet. You hand, over your, you hand your money over knowing that the consequences of not doing so will be severe. Now, just the similarity in the last, the last phrases in these two examples highlights something that they both have in common. The severity of, of the penalties, you handing over your money because of fear of the severity of the penalties. That's commonality, what they both have in common is of course power. They're both exercises of power. 
when the government asks you to pay your taxes, when the robber says, hand over your money, both of those are exercises of power. You do it because you know that it will be worse if you don't do it. So government and the robber have the ability to make you adhere to their demands, to make you adhere to their demands. And as we'll see, that's the central definition of authority. Now, is there anything different in these two examples? If you believe with the anarchists that government, with the anarchist position, let's say that government authority is, is never acceptable, is never right, then you may well say, no, there is nothing significantly different about these examples. Government might as well be a robber who says, hand over your money. In fact, that's for the anarchist exactly, um, for a lot of people, the libertarians as well, that's exactly what government is doing. Now, whether there's any difference here depends upon whether we think government has a, a right to do this that the robber does not. The government has a right to ask for your money, to ask you to do things that government, that private citizens in whatever capacity do not have. So there must be a relation between governments and, and citizens that makes, that makes it right here when it's not the case that it's right in example B. Now, this can't really depend on the fact that, you know, if you pay $1,000 to government, it may well go to um, a good cause. Let's say it's going to go to garbage collection, it's going to go to school, it's going to go to education, um, or at least a significant you know, percentage of it might. At first, I think we're inclined to say that, well, the 1000 to government goes to, you know, good things, the 1000 to the robber doesn't. However, just counterintuitively, just imagine this. Even if the robber, say, took your $1,000 and then said, well, you know, I'm going to take this money and give it to New York City to invest in our schools, it still wouldn't be right for the robber to ask you for your money. It still would not make that act legitimate. So what I'm saying is it doesn't depend on the consequences. It doesn't depend on what government or the robber does with your money that is the difference between the two. So let's, let's figure this out. Power is the ability to have one's commands obeyed. So both of these, the robber and the, the tax collector in the name of the government, are Exercises of, exercises of power. Both of them are commanding things and they are successful in their command, insofar as you hand over the money, of course. So both of them are, in that case, exercises of power. And to the extent that you're successful when you ask people to, or when you, I should say, command people to do things and they do it, to the extent that you're successful, you have power. Power is pretty much an empirical concept when we talked about the um, idea of empiricism before it's based upon experience. And what I mean by that is, is to know whether somebody has power is just to know the likelihood of somebody actually being obeyed. In other words, you have to look and see, well, if this institution, if this person issues commands, are they obeyed? You have to look and see whether that's true. So in that sense, power is very much an empirical concept. Um, so we can think about the, the tax collector and, and the gunman, in this case, both of them having power. Insofar as you hand over your money, okay? insofar as you comply with their commands, they would both, in that case, be exercises of power. Now, authority is something, let's say it's something else, something in addition to power. Okay? The case of authority, if we think that the government case is a case of authority and not just power, then we're saying that it's power plus something else. And that's something else we have to think of in terms of legitimate power. In other words, it's not just an exercise of power, but it's an exercise of power that we think is acceptable. At some level, we consent to that exercise of power. At some level, we think that it is justified that power is exercised in this way. So it's the fact that we consent, the fact that we agree to an exercise of power of this kind that ultimately makes it right. So authority we can define, I think, as power exercised in the context of a procedure 
or process that at some level expresses the consent of those subject to it. Now in the case of, of government, we can see that that depends on the consent of citizens through an elector or pro process through elections and electing representatives that then make the laws that say how much taxes you have to pay. So that's where consent finds a, finds a foothold in the question of, of government. So it's legitimate if it's exercised with some consent of, of citizens, that citizens accept that this is the way things are. Now that, that doesn't mean that there's no authority if there are no elections. It doesn't have to be expressed that way, but there has to be some process by which individuals are able to consent to a certain kind of rule. Okay, so let's have a look at some uh, brief examples of authority. The boss and the subordinate in a work relationship is, of course, a relationship of authority, most of the time at least. In other words, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an acceptance that a person in a position of, of um, in a higher position in a work relationship has the right to give commands to somebody in a lower relationship, so, or, or in a lower position. So it, it works in, in that way, and all, um, all work relationships are, of course, hierarchical. We, we all of us answer to people higher in the chain than ourselves. And usually we, we do so in the knowledge that, that that structure is part of what makes everything tick. So if we didn't have that structure, if it was a perfect democracy, um, things wouldn't work as, as well. Perhaps, you know, the company might not. Um, might not be able to function that way, it would quickly go out of business and everybody would lose their jobs. If that's true, then the, the idea of, of a hierarchy is something that is accept, accepted throughout the organization. I'm not saying that you know any kind of hierarchy is acceptable, of course, but some kind of boss and subordinate relationship is presupposed in, a, in, in, a, um, in any kind of work process in any kind of, of public work relationship. Professor and student, of, of course, is another one of these relationships. The professor has a lot of power. Power to set the syllabus, power to set grades, power to tell students to do things and when to do them. Now notice that it's, this is also um, one that is within certain boundaries. In other words, you know, professors can't tell students to do anything. Um, they can't sort of make things up. Everything has to be related to the course and what's going on in the, in the course and, and relevant things relevant to the course of, of study and the tasks. Um, so it's, it's, what I'm trying to say is that it's a relationship that is bounded by the institution, the learning institution. And what makes it what makes it authority rather than power is that students themselves at some level accept that relationship. They accept, students, all of, all of them accept that there is, a, um, there is a right for the professor to be able to make certain decisions, and in the end that benefits the student who obviously wants to learn things. So the learning relationship presupposes, again, a relationship of, of authority. And of course, judge and defendant. Um, whether the defendant or, or any person um, in a civil trial, whether that person wins the case or loses it, they accept the authority of the judge to make that decision. Note that this doesn't always, doesn't always mean that you agree with the decision. And again, you could say, you know, in a professor and a student relationship, you don't always agree with your grade. However, it, it may still be, be true that you accept that person, the judge or the professor, you accept that person's ability to make the decision. And I think that's key to an, to an authority relationship. It's not so much that you accept the particular decision, but you accept the procedure or process that gives rise to the decision. And I think that's a very important distinction. Now let's take a minute to take a look at the position of anarchism, which is one of the options
that we can take on the broad question of the justification of government. Now, anarchism is, is a very distinctive political philosophy, and what's distinctive about it is that it, it really asserts that there is really no justifiable political authority, that the only acceptable situation from the standpoint of what is justified, of what is um, legitimate, is to have no government whatsoever. So anarchism takes the position that all there is no such thing as legitimate authority when we are concerned with, with government. Government authority for, for, for anarchism cannot possibly be legitimate authority, and so it ends up, it's basically the same thing as an exercise of power. So anarchism refuses the distinction. It, it says that there is no such distinction between authority and power in the case of government. So anarchists argue that there is no conceivable justification for government. There's no justification for it. That is, in, we, cannot, we cannot give a moral argument to tell us why government should exist and should have the right to coerce us in the ways that it does. There is no justification for such authority, according to the anarchist position. Now that we've said that, we have to finesse that a little bit, because theoretical anarchists argue that although government cannot in fact be justified, we may have grounds to tolerate government out of practical necessity. And this claim is really saying basically this, that although from a theoretical point we can't justify government, if we got rid of it, things in fact may be even worse without it. It may be the case that you know people would, um, certain people would exploit the situation of the absence of political power and um, tyrannize and exploit everybody else. So anarchists argue that al although there is no theoretical justification, in other words, we cannot morally justify government's right to command us. It is, in fact, in theoretical terms, the same as the gunman who holds a gun to our head. Although that is true, we may have to tolerate it out of practical necessity. That is, it's better than the available, any available alternative options that, that we have available, human nature being what it is. So theoretical anarchists argue, although it cannot be justified, there are some practical reasons to tolerate it. Um, that position may sound to you like a bit of a cop-out, um, and it's sometimes sort of described as such, but it, it, is a, it is at least a coherent position. And let's, let's look at, at one defender of that position, and that is Robert Paul Wolf. Wolf focuses very closely on the conflict between authority and autonomy. And the quote from his work that's in the textbook is, is getting at precisely the distinction between these two and, as he sees it, the conflict between them. Autonomy, <coughs> we often think of autonomy and often reduce it to something like doing as you please or doing as you want to do. In fact, it's, it's slightly more, it's more of an elevated principle than that. It's not just doing as you desire. It's a much more, it's a much stronger and morally weighty idea of self-rule. And this means living according to principles that we ourselves can endorse. So autonomy is, is not just doing as you please, it's living according to principles and, and ideas that you can independently endorse as valid. So for example, if I'm a vegetarian, I have a rule that, I would have a rule that I, um, that, that let's say it's wrong to eat meat and, and I shall only eat things that are, um, um, that are, you know, vegetarian produce or whatever. So here's, here's a rule that, here's a principle and, and it, it underlines my autonomy. In other words, I myself, I myself decide on the rules that are to apply to my life. So vegetarianism would be, if it was chosen by me as my lifestyle, would be, you know, my autonomously chosen principle. So it, it works a little bit like that. We, we have the right to choose the principles that we live by. Now, Wolf says there's a conflict between that and authority. And authority, as we saw, is 
it claims a right to be obeyed. It claims a a um, a consent on the part of, of the governed to be obeyed. But what's implied in authority is doing something that somebody else commands. So let's take a look at this more closely. In terms of, of, of the distinction between the two, Wolf wants to claim that or in the case of autonomy, we have self rule so we rule ourselves in the case of authority we are under the rule of somebody else we follow the commands of somebody else and that's where the conflict comes in we're, we're either self-ruled or we're following the commands of somebody else now the problem with this the problem with this is is that the claim of democratic democratic government democratic political processes is that consent the idea of consent is created through our endorsements of the process as a whole. So that there is some idea of, it, there is some sense in which that process um, upholds our autonomy. We consent to live this way with, with other people under these particular procedures. So there is an, an element of our self-rule that, um, that is upheld there. The issue, I think, is that anarchists have a very strong, um, and ultimately, ultimately, I think, inviolable, idea of the independence of the individual in relation to society the idea that um, the idea that we sort of choose our own principles is is something of an illusion in any case because a lot of the principles we live by we, we only of course learn about and come to adopt by our relations w with others so the whole idea of autonomy is sort of in opposition to authority and in opposition to you know, organized society is, is is a little bit of a strained opposition. Um, so that, at any rate, is what the anarchist depends on. So there seems to be a bit of a weakness in the anarchist argument in that respect. Okay, so now let's turn to look at the social contract tradition. And this is a tradition of thought that argues, going back to you know the the beginning of modern societies when um when societies transition from feudal to capitalist societies the social contract theory came in, into being and it's really been a central part of of our modern political tradition centrally it's a theory about the justification of government and what makes government legitimate and it's it's an extremely popular and widespread theory in the tradition like i said it originated in the 17th century um, when political societies transitioned to away from feudalism and onto capitalist societies with the separation of political authority, economic power, and social relations. Um, and it's it keeps coming coming back again in different forms. It crops up in different forms. As as you see, part of the reading was on the U.S. Declaration of Independence, which is another appearance of the idea of a social contract so and that there are different formulations throughout political theory that rely on this idea the idea is based on on an implicit or explicit agreement made between the individuals who live under the government or between citizens and the government so that the justification of government depends on this this agreement this consent consent is a key idea that individuals give to live a certain way now when I said that this idea sort of came up with the with the rise of, of capitalism there is something there is something important of a connection there because of course something central to capitalism is the idea of economic relations as being relations of consent in other words we aren't born to do a certain profession to live a certain way um, you know, relations between a, a you know, work relations are not relations of blood, so that you would be born into a certain situation, you would be a, uh, a feudal serf, and that would be your destiny, if, if you want to put it that way. In capitalism, we freely contract with employers to, to perform certain tasks, to do certain forms of labor. We freely contract. And that is, is more or less the same thing on the level of political society that the social contract tradition is saying. So there is a very important link between the two. And this, like I say, has, has been a main part of the tradition throughout its history.
So let's take a look at the issue of a state of nature and social contract theory, which is a central, a central item really for, um, for how the theory wants us to think about politics and political relations and legitimacy. And then we'll, we'll examine two major theories in the tradition, Hobbes and Locke. So the idea of a state of nature is essentially a, I think it's best thought of as a thought experiment that social contract thinkers like Hobbes and Locke use in order to imagine what life would be like without government. So the idea is you think, imagine a situation where government did not exist. Imagine life without government. And then ask yourself, on what grounds would agents decide to come together? Agents meaning, you know, people who are, you know, free individuals. On what grounds would they decide to come together and decide to form a government. What possible interest could they have in doing that? And what would they set as the scope, the scope of government over them? What rules would, if you like, rule the the direction and, and the um, the processes of government? So that's the basic idea of a state of nature, and it appears in Hobbes, in Locke, and in Rousseau, who I talked about earlier, and, and other thinkers as well. A very um, a very major part of this. It can be thought of as a historical or in a, or in a hypothetical set. If you think of it as historical, then it's asking the question, what did happen before the formation of government? What, what did people do that led them to form a government? In, in other words, you know, historically, what were things like before government emerged? Right? What, what, what were people doing and what led them to think about forming government? If you think of it in the hypothetical sense, then it's not asking, you know, historically, what was it like? It's asking, it's, it's asking us to imagine it, and it's saying, let's imagine a state where government doesn't exist. What, what would it be like, and what would motivate people to form a government? And I think the hypothetical sense, is, uh, the hypothetical sense of understanding it is more plausible, simply because the idea of, of a a historical situation before government is somewhat problematic. And I think it's, it's partially problematic because, you know, we, if you think of, of you know, societies organizing themselves and selecting some process of rule, well, that, that occurs throughout human society as, as, as long as we know it. So really, we, we can't, historically, we just can't get at a situation where there was, you know, no rule whatsoever. So this is this is purely a hypothetical thought experiment. What would it mean for people to, you know, if if government didn't exist, what would people come together for, and what delimitation, what limits would they set to what government would be able to do? Now Thomas Hobbes, like I said earlier, was writing at the time of the English Civil War, and he had a very pessimistic idea of the state of nature which he said would basically be like a state of war. Now, because of that, because he sees that as individuals in the state of nature, we would basically be in a condition of, of you know, perpetual conflict. Not that we would always be killing each other, but that because there's no common power, as Hobbes says, there would always be the prospect of dispute breaking out. Um, you know, whenever there was a disagreement between us, because we would have no means of resolving the, con the conflict, it would gradually escalate to state of war. And Hobbes had a very pessimistic idea of human nature as, as well, that we're driven by self-interest and the desire for security. And we, the more the more we acquire, the less insecure we are. So, you know, paradoxically, the more that we have, the less insecure we feel, and the more that we want, which leads us perpetually into in in serving our interests, we're led perpetually into a state of conflict. So Hobbes sees the formation of governments as the agreement of individuals to give up, to sacrifice a portion of their liberty in order to secure a condition of peace. And for Hobbes, government is essentially a coercive power. It's a power that forces individuals to keep their agreements and hence forces them to keep their natural selfishness in check. And that's very nicely illustrated in this passage from Leviathan on page 557. The only way to erect such a common power, Hobbes says, is maybe able to defend them, 
individuals from the invasion of foreigners and the injuries of one another, and thereby to secure them in such sort as that by their own industry and by the fruits of the earth they may nourish themselves and live contentedly, is to confer all their power and strength upon one man, the Leviathan, the sovereign, or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by, a pl by plurality of voices into one will, which is as much as to say, to appoint one man or assembly of men to bear their person, and every one to own and acknowledge himself to be author of whatsoever he that so beareth that person shall act or cause to be acted in those things which concern the common peace and safety, and therein to submit their wills every one to his will, and their judgments to to his judgment. So you can see it's it's a it's a handing over of your power to judge. It's a handing over uh, of your power to judge according to your own will and to act according to your own desire and to leave the authority to cede the authority to the sovereign power. And that's very much how Hobbes sees government. It keeps our our selfish interest in 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 looking at things in terms of our own case, it keeps that in check. And it keep, keeps in check the constantly expanding conflict caused by our pursuit of our self-interests. So that's a, a, pessimistic, um, a pessimistic view of, of government and why it comes into being, as you can see. Now, John Locke had a very different view of the state of nature, and hence as of government than Thomas Hobbes. Locke believed, now Locke was also a theorist like Hobbes of the, at the beginning of, of capitalist, what we can call capitalist modernity, and he, he was also theorizing the transitions in capitalism and trying to develop a theory of political power, of legitimate political power in this situation. However, Locke believed that the state of nature was not, as Hobbes had said, a state, a state of war but was in fact a condition ruled by what Locke called a law of nature. And that law of nature urged the, in the protection of individuals' natural rights. And foremost among those rights for Locke were life, liberty, and property. Life and liberty are self-explanatory, and I think property really keys us into the importance of, of capitalism for these thinkers. But, that one of the things here is the right of individuals to acquire property, and to use it as they see fit. And when we, when we get to Marx, we'll see the, the problematic things about that assumption. But certainly Locke is very much, very much a, a part of that, of that tradition that wants to say that the protection of individuals' right of, of freedom to do as they please, to acquire property, and to acquire wealth through their property is, is part of their natural rights, rights guaranteed by the law of nature. So Locke has a different view on the state of nature, not as pessimistic. It wouldn't be a state of war. However, there would be certain inconveniences, as Locke calls them. So the natural rights guaranteed by the laws, laws of nature are God-given inherent rights that government cannot take away. And of course, you can see that thinking replicated almost exactly in the Declaration of Independence, which also talks about God-given rights that cannot be taken away by any government. So that thinking comes directly from John Locke and also Thomas Paine and other thinkers who were part of this tradition. Thomas Paine more of a radical than, than Locke who's very much, um, at least nowadays we would say, somebody who was a traditionalist in this vein of thinking. Now, according to Locke, the only justification for leaving the state of nature, the only justification for moving to another condition, is to better secure the protection of our rights. So the only reason we leave the state of nature is simply because of what Locke calls the inconveniences, the fact that our rights are not necessarily protected in that condition. Again, there are disputes and, and there are uncertainties about how the law, how the law of nature applies. So this is what Locke says from the, the very famous Second Treatise on Government. In our text, it's on page 562. The inconveniences that they are therein exposed to, therein meaning the state of nature, by the irregular and uncertain exercise of the power every man has of punishing the transgressions of others, 
make them take sanctuary under the established laws of government, and therein seek the preservation of their property. It is this makes them so willingly give up every one his single power of punishing to be exercised by such alone, as shall be appointed to it amongst them, and by such rules as the community or those authorized by them to that purpose shall agree on. And in this we have the original right and rise of both the legislative and executive power, as well as of governments and societies themselves. Okay. So the basic idea again is is that it's not a it's not a sort of giving up and submission under a um, under a power that then has complete command over us like in Hobbes. It it's more that we we seek the better protection of our natural rights by erecting a government. We seek the better execution of the law of nature. So we're not so, so much giving anything up as creating amongst us an authority that can better secure what we have by nature anyway. Those rights that Locke identifies as life, liberty, and property. So that's how Locke conceives the beginning of, of government. So again, it's a, as you can see, it's a social contract idea. It's the idea that we form an agreement to establish an authority. But as you can see in Locke, the, that authority is very much more limited than it is in Hobbes. And it's limited in the sense that it, it's, li its purpose is to, is to execute the law of nature, is to execute our God-given rights to liberty, property, uh, life, liberty, and property. And here's the, the important thing, if it transgresses those rights, if government takes that property unwarrantedly, um, or, or if it interferes with our liberty, individuals, Locke says, have a right of revolution against the government if it violates the social contract. So Locke's thinking leaves us in a very different place to say Hobbes is thinking. Now the social contract theory is often criticized, one of the probably the most most common criticism against it for being historically inaccurate. And what I mean here is is it's sort of portrayed as an agreement among people, but think for example of the exclusions, the historical exclusions that accompanied the historical founding of democracy in the United States. In other words, if we try to portray it in the social contract sense as a as an agreement amongst people to form a government, it only works to a certain extent, and it works insofar, of course, as there is in fact an inclusive agreement. And if we think of the exclusions that are part of this historical process, we think of the American the American tribes, of course, and we think of the um, the African slaves, who were also completely excluded from the process of, of deliberations and the historical founding of democracy. So the the native um, the native tribes, African slaves, were among those excluded, and also we'd have to mention, of course, women, who again were on the margins of public society, but didn't really have a voice and a right to speak. So historically, in historical terms, it doesn't match up to the theory. The founding of democracy and the idea doesn't match up to the theory. Now that's not to say that you know, the theory could be, or that the practice might be corrected in the course of time, so that it might better approximate to the theory in the course of time. But whether that's true, people are very much in disagreement. Whether whether that is true, obviously there are there are criticisms of democracy today that again it's loaded towards the favor of certain groups of people that maybe you know it o only the rich really have a say so again these these questions still um, still plague the social contract theory in its attempt to account for our democracy all right let's Ask the question, what do you think? In other words, how much do our political institutions today embody the idea of a social contract? Is there evidence of an agreement that is regularly renewed? What are the mechanisms or process which prevent the social contract from working as well as it should? So what I want you to think about 
on the basis of, of this presentation is how much our, our institutions today are led by the idea of consent or agreement that is regularly renewed. Obviously we have elections, but to what extent are those elections a consent to government? How much choice do we really have? How much scope do we really have to make our views heard and to select alternatives? What are the mechanisms or processes? You know, even if we select political alternatives, is it true that there are mechanisms within the political process that prevent you know, politics from being the execution of the common will? So what are the barriers to that? What does the media do? How does it promote government? How does it, how does it interfere with it? as a lot of people claim it does. So, you know, what are the exclusions within society? What are the differentials among race, class, and gender? And how do these, how do these affect people's ability to have a say and, and to be excluded or included in the process? So those are the things that we should bear in mind when we evaluate what the theory says to us today.